letting listen to you all. Welcome. To Helen, Sands, and Room 38. I praise you with my heart, all my heart, and in the presence of the mighty, I will sing praises to you. I bow down towards your holy temple and praise your name for your love and your faithfulness. For you magnify above all your name and your word. On the day I called, you answered me, and you made me bold with strength to my soul. And all the kings of the earth will praise you, Adonai. And when you hear your mouth speak, you will be, you will sing of the ways of Adonai. For great is the glory of Adonai. For though Adonai is exalted, yet he looks upon the lowly. But the haughty he knows from afar. And though I walk and trouble you, revive me. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand delivers me. And Adonai will fulfill his purpose for you me and your loving kindness and I endures forever. Amen. Amen. Let's rise together.
nothing else can save us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Yeshua. Lover of our soul. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. This is our creators. <laughs> Exodus 18, 1 to 27. Now Yitro, the priest of Midian, Moshe's father-in-law, heard about all that God had done for Moshe and for Israel, his people, how Adonai had brought Israel out of Egypt. After Moshe had sent away his wife Zipporah and her two sons, Yitro, Moshe's father-in-law, had taken them back. The name of one of the one son was Gershom, for Moshe had said, I have been a foreigner in a foreign land. And the name of the other was Eliezer, my God helps, because the God of my father helped me by rescuing me from Pharaoh's sword. Yitro, Moshe's father-in-law, brought Moshe's sons and wife to him in the desert where he was encamped at the mountain of God. He sent word to Moshe, I, your father-in-law Yitro, I'm coming to you with your wife and her two sons. Moshe went out to meet his father-in-law, prostrated himself and kissed him. Then after inquiring of each other's welfare, they entered into the tent. Moshe told his father-in-law all that Adonai had done to Pharaoh and the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all the hardships they had suffered while traveling and how Adonai had rescued them. Yitro rejoiced over all the good that Adonai had done for Israel by rescuing them from the Egyptians. Yitro said, Blessed be Adonai, who has rescued you from the Egyptians and from Pharaoh, who has rescued the people from the harsh hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that Adonai is greater than all other gods. Why have I got arrogantly suddenly? Arrogantly. Yeah, it doesn't make sense, is that right? Okay. <laughs> Yitro, Moshe's father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God, and Aharon came with all the leaders of Israel to share the meal before God with Moshe's father-in-law. The following day, Moshe sat, sat to settle disputes with the people, while the people stood around Moshe from morning till evening. <clears throat> when Moshe's father-in-law saw all that he was doing to the people, he said, What is this that you are doing to the people? Why do you sit there alone with all the people standing around you from morning till evening? Moshe answered his father-in-law, It's because the people come to me seeking God's guidance. Whenever they have a dispute, it comes to me. I judge between one person and another and I explained to them God's laws and his teachings. <coughs> Moshe's father-in-law <coughs> said to him, what you are doing isn't good. You will certainly wear yourself out, and not only yourself, but these people here with you as well. It's too much for you. You can't do it alone by yourself. So listen now to what I have to say. I will give you some advice, and God will be with you. You should represent the people before God, and you should bring their cases to God. You should also teach them the laws and the teachings, and show them how to live their lives and what work they should do. But you should choose from among all the people competent men who are God-fearing, honest, and why have I got something missing? <laughs> and incorruptible. Okay, I haven't got that. Uh, uh, I'll have to read it from your Bible. Hygiene <laughs> covered it. You what? Yeah. yeah, I hope I can read it without glasses. You want to borrow mine? Yes. <laughs> 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 okay, where are mine's open? And incorruptible. And now I can't see because I'm giving you my glasses. Incorruptible. <laughs> 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 Um, okay, 
This all came about because we had a huge discussion, my husband and I, this morning on this passage. <laughs> and I think I left the page behind. So there you go. It's all his fault. <laughs> and he's still studying it, I might add, when I left. <laughs> But you should choose from among all the people competent men who are God-fearing, honest, and incorruptible to be their leaders in charge of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Normally, they will settle the people's disputes. They should bring you the difficult cases, but ordinary matters they should decide themselves. In this way, they will make it easier for you and share the load with you. If you do this, and God is directing you to do it, you will be able to endure, and all these people, too, will arrive at their destination peacefully. Amen. Is that right? Yes. And there's a bit more. Moshe, Moshe paid attention to his father-in-law's counsel and did everything he said. Moshe chose competent men from all Israel and made them heads over the people in charge of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. As a general rule, they settled the people's disputes. The difficult cases they brought to Moshe, but every simple matter they decided themselves. Then Moshe let his father-in-law leave, and he went off to his own country. So, in the third month after B'nai Israel had gone out from the land of Egypt, that same day they arrived at the wilderness of Sinai. They travelled from Rephidim, came into the wilderness of Sinai, and set up camp in the wilderness. Israel camped there right in front of the mountain. Moshe went up to God, and Adonai called to him from the mountain, saying, Say this to the house of Jacob, and tell B'nai Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you listen closely to my voice and keep my covenant, then you will be my own treasure from among all people, for all the earth is mine. So as for you, you will be to me a kingdom of Kohenim, a holy nation. These are the words which you are to speak to B'nai Israel. So Moshe went out, so, so Moshe went, called all the elders of the people and put before them all these words that Adonai had commanded them. All of the people answered together and said, Everything that Adonai has spoken, we will do. And Moshe reported the words of the people to Adonai. Adonai said to Moshe, I am about to come to you in a thick cloud, so the people will hear when I speak with you and believe you forever. Mm. Then Moshe told the words of the, of the people to Adonai. Adonai said to Moshe, Go to the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow. Let them wash their clothing be ready for the third day. For on the third day Adonai will come down upon the Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. You are to set boundaries for the people all around, saying, Be very careful not to go up onto the mountain, or to touch the border of it. Whoever touches the mountain will surely be put to death. Not a hand is to touch it, but he will surely be stoned or shot through. Whether it is an animal or a man, it will not live. When the shofar sounds, they may come up to the mountain. Then Moshe went down from the mountain to the people, consecrated them, and then they washed their clothing. He said to the people, Be ready for the third day. Do not draw near do not draw near your wives. In the morning of the third day they were thundering. There was thundering and lightning and a thick cloud on the mountain and a blast from an exceedingly loud shofar. All of the people in the camp trembled, and Moshe brought the people out of the camp to meet God and they stood at the lowest part of the mountain. Now the entire Mount Sinai was in smoke because of Adonai, and he descended upon it in fire. The smoke ascended, and the smoke of a furnace, like the smoke of a furnace. The whole mountain quaked greatly. 
When the sound of the shofar grew louder and louder, Moshe spoke, and God answered him with a thunderous sound. Then Adonai came down onto the Mount Sinai, at the top of the mountain. Adonai called Moses, Moses up to the top of the mountain, so Moshe went up. Then Adonai said to Moshe, Go down and warn the people, lest they break through to see Adonai, and many of them die. Even the Kohenim who come near to the Adonai must consecrate themselves so that Adonai does not break out against them. Moshe said to Adonai, The people cannot come up the Mount Sinai, for you are the one who warned us, saying, Set boundaries around the mountain and consecrate it. Then Adonai said to him, Go down, you are to come back up, you and Aaron and with you. But do not let the Kohanim and the people break through to come up to Adonai, or he will break out against them. So Moshe went down to the people and told them. And Elohim spoke these words, saying, I am Adonai your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. Do not make for yourselves a graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, on the earth, or below, or in the water, or under the earth. And do not bow down to them, and do not let anyone make you serve them. For I, Adonai, am your God, and I am a jealous God bringing the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to the thousands of generations of those who love me and keep my spot. You must not take any, the name of Adonai your God, Elohim, in vain, for Adonai will, not, uh, um, will hold him guiltless. That takes his name in vain. Remember Yom Shabbat. To keep it holy, you are to work six days and on the on the um, and do all your work. But on the seventh day it is the Shabbat to Adonai your God, and it you shall not do any work, not you nor your children nor your daughter nor your son nor your, your male servant nor your female servant nor your cattle nor the outsider that it is within your gates. For in six days Adonai made heaven on earth and the, and the seas. And all that was in them and rested on the seventh day. And thus Adonai blessed them, blessed Yom Shabbat, made it holy on your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land which Adonai your God is giving to you. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not be a fault witness against your neighbor, do not covet your neighbor's house, your neighbor's wife, his manservant, his maidservant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that is in your neighbor's. All the people witnessed the thundering and the lightning and the sound of the shofar. people saw it they trembled and they stood afar so they said to Moshe you speak to us and we will listen but do not let God speak to us or we will die so Moshe said to the people do not be afraid for God has come to retest you so that his fear may be in you so that you do not sin and the people stood afar off while Moshe drew near to the thick darkness where Elohim was. Then Adonai said to Moshe, Stay, Say this to B'nai Israel. You yourselves have seen that I have spoken to you from heaven. Do not make gods of silver alongside me. And do not make gods of gold for yourselves. And you are to make an altar for, of earth for me. And, where, and, and there you will sacrifice your burnt offerings your fellowship of offerings 
your sheep and your cattle. In every place which I cause my name to be mentioned, I will come to you and I will bless you. And when you make for me an altar of stones, do not build it from cut stones. For if you use a tool on it, you will have profaned it. Nor are you to go up to my altar on steps, so that your nakedness would not be covered while on it. I thought you might have had a bit of smoke as well. Must have been awesome in the presence of God yes. like that. Yeah. So terrifying. The yeah. next song we're singing is about um, God being with us, and of course that's Emmanuel. It's the translation of the Hebrew. Emmanuel means God with us. So aren't we pleased that He is with us through whatever, whatever we're facing, good or bad, or you know, whatever's happening in your life right now, he is with you.
Isaiah chapter 6. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw Adonai sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Seraphim were standing above him, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. One called out to another and said, Holy, 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 Adonai Savat, <clears throat> the whole earth is full of his glory. Then the posts of the door trembled at the voice of those who called, and the house was filled with smoke. Then I said, Oi, to me, for I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I am dwelling among a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the king, Adonai Savat. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a glowing coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away, and your sins are atoned for. Then I heard the voice of Adonai saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? So I said, Nay, send me. Then he said, Go, <clears throat> tell this people, hear without understanding, and see without perceiving. Make your heart, make the heart of this people fat their ears heavy and their eyes blind, else that they would see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. Then I said, Adonai, how long? He answered, until cities are laid waste and without inhabitant, houses are without people, and the land is utterly desolate. Adonai will drive people far away, desertion the desertion of the land will be vast. Though a tenth shall be in it, it will again be burned. As a terabith tree or as an oak, whose stump remains when cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump. Then Isaiah chapter 9, verse 5, Prince of Peace. For unto us a child is born, a son is given to us, and the government will be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, my Father of Eternity, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and shalom, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it through justice and righteousness. From now until forevermore, the zeal of Adonai Savot will accomplish this. You know, it's interesting listening to that um in the first part of Isaiah, it talks about that God didn't want their ears to be opened, didn't want their eyes to see, didn't want their hearts to, to be touched, and they didn't want, he didn't want them to be healed. And um, to, to you and I, that seems an incredibly foreign thing to seem it, that God who cares and wants all people to come to him to want to do. But God has his, had his purposes and is in place. And often we try to second guess it and we try to help him out. But um, in reality, we need to follow what he requires. And some of those things he did for a purpose because he wanted them to desperately return, not just to um, do it half-heartedly. And so as part of it, he wanted them to linger a while. So it's interesting. Sometimes we want things to happen and instantly, don't we? But God will work it out. Sometimes don't rush it. Well, coming up tomorrow is uh, Holocaust Remembrance Day. And we'll just pray for, for people about that just in a minute. And because um, it's quite a significant time for many people and, and remembrance and some people would say oh just let it go, just forget and things but it's important God wants us to be rem to remind us of a lot of different things so that we actually don't keep going around the same mountains again and again it's just really important that we don't keep going around the same mountains again and again let's just uh, have a few moments of prayer and then I'll just um,
Uh, you can most welcome, if someone needs healing, just come and receive these. And just to pray for one another. Um, and to, if anyone has needs, to share amongst each, each, each one. And, uh, and pray for one another. And then we'll continue on with the readings. Father, we just thank you right now for your people. We think, think right now as people prepare for the Holocaust Remembrance Day tomorrow that uh, around the world that uh, their, their hearts will, will be turned to you and, that, um, and that, that various things have occurred in the past and as we read, read in, um, from your word, Father, in, uh, in Isaiah, that, uh, that you actually want people to, to turn whole, wholly to you and you will use whatever means you want to turn people's heart towards you. And Father, we just uh, know there were so many grieving people, that uh, people who were grieving over lost families and, uh, and whole generations um, that occur because of the selfish man, selfishness of man and the sin of mankind. But we just certainly pray that people's, especially the, the Jewish people's heart, will be turned to you and their eyes will begin to be opened afresh and their ears opened. And the things that you've written on their hearts will become life to them. And as, as they start to read the scriptures again and afresh and, and, go, th- and go through the, with their prayers, that, Father, that they, their eyes and spiritual eyes will be opened and they will see you. They will see you in the wholeness of who they didn't want to see. And that you're sure that they will clearly um, begin to see that you were there with them even in those difficult times. Father, we just ask you for that right now. Prepare those occasions. And if we meet people, Father, Lord, just uh, the, the, the Ruach, Ruach, just go before us and let you just open up their hearts and ears. Thank you. Hallelujah. Okay, Shalom. You sitting comfortably? Then I'll begin. (laughs) Seeing the crowds, Yeshua walked up the hill. After he sat down, his Talmudim came to him and he began to speak. And this is what he taught them. How blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. How blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. How blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. And how blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. How blessed are those who show mercy, for they'll be shown mercy. How blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. How blessed are those who make peace, for they will be called sons and daughters of God. How blessed are those who are persecuted, Because they pursue righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And how blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and tell all kinds of vicious lies about you because you follow me. Rejoice, be glad, because your reward in heaven is great. They persecuted the prophets before you in the same way. You are salt for the land. But if salt becomes tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except for being thrown out for people to trample on. You are the light for the world. A town built on a hill can't be hidden. And likewise, when people light a lamp, they don't cover it with a bowl, but put it on a lampstand so that it shines for everyone in the house. And in the same way, let your light shine before people so that they may see the good things you do and praise your Abba in heaven. Amen. Do not imagine that I have come to violate the Torah or the words of the prophets. I have not come to violate, but to fulfill. For amen, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one yod or one thorn will pass away from the Torah until all has been established. Therefore, the man who violates one of these small mitzvot and teaches sons of men to do like him will be called small in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever does and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. 
For I say to you, if your Zedekah is not greater than the Zedekah of the scholars and the Prushim, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Have you not heard that it was said to the first ones, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to a court of law? Yet I say to you that whoever is enraged against his brother baselessly is liable to a court of law, and whoever says to his brother, Reka, is liable to a Sanhedrin, and whoever calls him a reprobate is made liable to the fire of Gehenna. Therefore, if you are offering your sacrifice at the altar, and remember that your brother has a dispute with you, leave your sacrifice there in front of the altar and go. Atone before the face of your brother, then afterward come and offer your sacrifice. Act quickly to settle your dispute with a man while you are still on the road with him, or else the man of your dispute will turn you over to the judge, and the judge will turn you over to the officer, and you will be sent to jail. Amen, I tell you, you will not get out from there until you have paid the last pruta. You have heard that it was said to the first ones, you shall not commit adultery. Yet I say to you, whoever gazes at a woman to covet her has surely committed adultery with her in his heart. And if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and cast it away from you. It is better for you that one of your members is lost than for your entire body to descend to Gehenna. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away from you. It is better for you that one of your members is lost than for your entire body to descend to Gehenna. Then some Pharisees and Torah scholars came to Yeshua from Jerusalem. They said, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not do their ritual hand washing when they eat bread. In answering, he said to them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, Honour your father and mother, and he who speaks evil of father or mother must be put to death. But you say, Whoever tells his father or mother, Whatever you might have gained from me is a gift to God, he need not honour his father. On account of your tradition, you made void the word of God. Hypocrites, rightly did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, This people honours me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Then Yeshua called the crowd and said to them, Hear and understand. It's not what goes into the mouth that makes the man unholy, but what comes out of the mouth. This makes the man unholy. Then the disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees took offence when they heard this saying? But he replied, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Leave them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if a blind man leads a blind man, both will fall into a pit. I'm reading from uh, Matthew 19, starting at verse 16. Now behold, one came to him and said, Teacher, what good shall I do to have eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Yeshua said to him, There is only one who is good. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Which ones, he said? Yeshua said, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony. Honour your father and mother and love your neighbour as yourself. All these I've kept, the young man said to him. What do I still lack? Yeshua said to him, if you wish to be perfect, Go sell what you own and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But when the young man heard this statement, he went away grieving, for he had much property. Then Yeshua said to his disciples, Amen, I tell you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were utterly astonished and said, Then who can be saved? And looking, 
Yeshua said to them, With men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Then Peter said to him, Look, we've left everything to follow you, so what will we have? And Yeshua said to them, Amen, I tell you, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne in the new world, you will have you who have followed me shall also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or property for my name's sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18. Entering the unshakable kingdom. For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched, and to a blazing fire, and to darkness and gloom, and storm, and to the blast of a shafar, and a voice whose words made those who heard it beg that not another word be spoken to them, for they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. So terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am quaking with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, a joyous gathering. And in the assembly of the firstborn who are written, in a scroll in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous ones made perfect, and to Yeshua, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks of something better than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse the one who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused the one who was warning them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject the one who warns us from heaven. His voice shook the earth then, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. Now this phrase, yet once more, shows the removal of things that are shaken. That is, created things. So that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude. Through this we may offer worship in a manner pleasing to God with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire it's good to see you. It's a long weekend, isn't that nice? Get to have Monday, sleep in, so good. If you're visiting with us, yeah, welcome. It's lovely to have you. 
some of you have visited before. It's good to see you. Um, there's just a couple of notices that I want to draw to your attention uh, that St George's Church in Gate Park are doing a free summer lecture series on a Sunday night, and the first one's tonight. And it's around the uh, history of Gate Pa, and it's around um, the Treaty of Waitangi. And so it's the next three Sunday nights. It's a koha. Um, we've got some more information at the info desk if that's something you would like to learn more about. And the other thing is there is a meeting. Uh, there's a new group started called New Zealand for Israel and um, the McLeans, is it the McLeans that come here? The McLeods that come here, he started that. And so he's, there's a meeting in Hamilton. The details are behind me, aren't they? I can see you all looking. <laughs> so we're not going to go as a congregation, but we just thought that some of you might be interested uh, in doing that, and you could receive his newsletter too. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of thunder and lightning and... Scary stuff happening, isn't it, in the book of Exodus? So last week we looked at how God dramatically rescued his people coming through the Red Sea. And it was God's intention, however, not just to bring them out of the land of misery and lead them to their final destination. It was his... Dis it was his um Gosh, my mind's really gone blank. It was his... Can I have a drink of water, please? <clears throat> it was there's my bottle there. Um, it was his. Um, he wanted to get Egypt out of them, just like he likes to get Egypt out of us. And sometimes that's just easier said than done, isn't it? And sometimes you get round the mountain, you think, I'm sure I've been here before. <laughs> what else do I have to do? And often, because because God treats me like an onion, and I'm hoping He treats you like that one, that too. It's just lots of layers, and I'm really glad that when I gave my heart to the Lord many years ago, that um, He didn't say, "Right, we're going to sort you out," because I'd probably been ended up a pickled onion. <laughs> he just takes a layer off and a layer off, and He slowly cooks me and moves me, and, and like you, you're all nodding, like, "Yeah." And it'll be like that till the day we die. So don't sit there and think that anyone here, we've, all, we've got it all together, you know, and we look really good today, but you don't live with us. <laughs> and you don't, um, yeah, we don't know each other um, through and through. Only God does. Isn't that good? So glad he didn't invent that, you know, there, there could be a thought bubble going above our head. Like you see those movies? I'm so glad you don't know what's going on in my head. And I'm really glad not to know what's going on in your head either. But he does. He does. And the more I realise that, the more I need to watch what I'm thinking in my head. Because he knows what's going on in there. Thank you, Joel. So as I was re reading all these readings this week, I was struck <coughs> by how much God loved his people and how much he loved us. And he put boundaries. It talks about boundaries in Exodus. It's not a modern term. But readings always raise questions in my mind as you're reading them. Don't you think, oh, but why did that happen and what about that? And I want to know how long does Zipporah and Moses have to do life on their own? Zipporah went back to live with her dad and maybe her six other sisters with her two sons. And Moses went off into Egypt. And why did Adonai try to kill Moses? And then Zipporah, this is last week, did the whole circumcision thing and flung it at him, and you're a man of blood. And I think a movie, they, they should put that in the movie, Ten Commandments. <laughs> and that reminded me of another reading I was doing this week in Second Samuel when Adonai asked David to number the people and then was angry when David did it. Like, you think, what was that about? I actually text Joel. He was on his way to work. And reading this, why, why would he do this? And we came, we agreed that it was a test of his obe David's obedience and of his knowledge of God's ways. Well, that's quite scary. If God ever put me to the test and asked me to do something, what, what would I say? Oh, no, I, I can't do that because your word says this. Or would I say, aye, aye, captain. And then he'd get cross with me because I didn't actually do what, his word tells me to do. He should have known better. And maybe it wasn't so Joab would be tested because he was willing to obey 
what Adonai said. And he even said to David, oh, I don't think you should be doing that. David said, no, yes, we're going to do that. So that was in the final chapters of 2 Samuel, if you want to have a look and, uh, and explore. And how was it for Moses to t- be taking advice from his father-in-law? And that led me to think, well, do I take advice easily? And am I teachable? I'm not always, especially when Joel tells me what to do. And he hardly ever does, but I'll go, it just happened before, and he goes, don't talk to me now. Don't talk to me now. And, and like, that wasn't very teachable, was it? <laughs> our, one of our daughters in her work this week, um, she's learning a new job. She's doing very well. She's never worked these many hours before, and she's only 19. And she said she had to go to her boss during the day and apologise because she said, I wasn't very easy to teach. I said, what did your boss do, fall over in a faint? Like, (laughs) that's incredible that a young person could recognise that about herself and then go and say to the person who was teaching her, I'm really sorry, I wasn't very easy to teach today. Maybe I should take a leaf out of her book. Sorry, Joel, I wasn't very easy to teach today. (laughs) And who was it that blew the shofar in Exodus 19 as you're you're reading along? And oh, wow, God blew the shofar. What a glorious and frightening way to get the children of Israel's attention. And we think that if it happened to us, we would have been obedient. I don't think so. (laughs) And in our readings again in Exodus 19, look at the level of trust that's evident in in their lives. In verse 21, Moses stood right close to to God and the people stood far off. Mind you, they hadn't had the conversations with Adonai that Moses had had. Even Aaron hadn't had those conversations. And so they were standing far away. But Moses was right up there, wasn't he? He was an amazing man, Moses. And, yeah, how are we doing on our levels of trust this week? We say we trust God. Do we? Do we really? And so the themes of boundaries and love continued on in Isaiah um, that was read by Barbara as he realised he realized the boundaries and standards that God had for him and how far he'd sh- fallen short. And it's not surprising that, that um, the, the coal went onto his lips because we get ourselves into so much trouble from the talking we do, don't we? And then we read in Matthew how Yeshua came to earth so that we could see how our heavenly Abba looks like, and he knew his boundaries. Because in Isaiah, it said about Yeshua, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, my Father of Eternity, Prince of Peace. And then we read in Matthew when the young man asks Yeshua, So, teacher, what good shall I do to have eternal life? Why do you ask me what is good, Yeshua said? There is only one who is good. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Don't you think it would have been really easy for Yeshua to pull rank? Well, actually, did you read about me in Isaiah? They said I'm wonderful. And he could have, but he doesn't. He deflects the praise and the glory back to his father. Because he could have said, well, actually, my name's wonderful. And, um, you know, you can call me Wonderful Yeshua from now on. He, he never did that. He was such, so humble. He is wonderful. We call him wonderful, but he never called himself wonderful. And then we read in Matthew 5 that Jeff read uh, the Beatitudes. These are boundaries filled with love. And then there's some readings. If you get our notes, there's some extra readings for today that we didn't do. There was boundaries for service in Acts. And in Romans, there's boundaries about who is Jewish and who is not. And then in 1 Timothy, there's boundaries for leaders. Our whole scriptures, we can't, there's no reason why we can't live how God wants us to live because it's all in the instruction book. And in that reading of Matthew 15, it really struck me. This people honours me with their lips, but their heart is far from me just as the people stood far off and Moses was close. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And how how often we can do that. We can teach our opinion. We can teach what we think rather than uh, the commandments of what God has has wanted. And, And that's a challenge to me. How long have I, you know, how often have I taught or talked to people 
rather than using scripture, I've used something I read in a book or something that I think about. It's such a loving challenge, isn't it? But some of you are sitting there thinking, well, I didn't think the challenges were loving at all. And I'm guessing that's because my father was a loving man and he put boundaries around me. So I think that God loves me and that's what he keeps doing. But some of you haven't had people in your lives to, that have put loving boundaries around you. And so this is a bit of a journey to look at them as boundaries and not someone else telling me what to do and wait for the punishment if I get it wrong. And so I just wanted to, felt I needed to say that today. It's very easy for me to talk. I had a really lovely family. Joel comes from a lovely family. But so, it's, so I, I love God and I know that he loves me and his voice to me is kind and gracious. Whereas I know sometimes when you first come to God, if you haven't had anyone nice in your life tell you anything nice, you just think it's another voice telling you what to do and how you're such a failure. A friend was telling me this week that a problem is only something can, that can be fixed. If it presents as, as something that can't be fixed, then it requires a boundary. I'll read that again. A problem is something that can be fixed. If it presents as something that can't be fixed, then it requires a boundary. I'm a bit of a fixer. I like to help people. Which in itself isn't wrong, but it is if the person doesn't want to be fixed. Or the situation's actually none of my business. And from today's readings, we can practice putting boundaries in and around our lives. And are the boundaries based on scripture? Are they loving? And is it how the Ruach Hagodesh is leading me to, put, to talk to you? And, and is it something I should be involved in? So it's so easy to see other people's blind spots and the things that they might not do well. But when we point one finger there, we've got four, three fingers pointing back at us. Have you noticed that the things that annoy you about other people are the very things in your own life? <laughs> it's so frustrating. <laughs> Jethro helped Moses put boundaries around his life and the lives of others. He loved Moses enough to watch him and then suggest a solution. Let's see if we can learn from Jethro as he helps Moses put boundaries around his life. I'm fascinated by the, by the character of Jethro. He was a Midianite priest, and it calls him a priest, but he was a priest of idol worship, referring, and this was referred to, this was his former position before he got to meet Moses here in the desert. Others think that he was a minister of Midian, which gave him a political position, which would seem that they're compatible because in ancient times, the authorities of religion and of the state were commonly linked. So maybe he was a politician, but maybe he was a priest. He was in a relationship with Moses because Moses was his son-in-law. I'm so interested that Jethro didn't tell Moses off when he first met him about leaving his wife and sons with him for so long. But some scholars think it was probably under a year and that Moses left um, Zipporah and the sons with her father um, to say, to because he wasn't sure what he was going to be facing in Egypt, perhaps. And so he was keeping them safe. However, Zipporah didn't say, bye, love, I'll pray for you as you go, did she? We don't hear anything of what she says. She threw a foreskin at him. <laughs> Fancy that as a goodbye present. So the Torah, so, and then they meet together, Moses and kiss Jethro, which was expected in that custom, and they asked after each other, and Moses um, told Jethro all that had happened in Egypt, and Jethro was very pleased and re rejoiced with Moses with joy. So the Torah uses an unusual word to express Jethro's joy, vayachad. Some commentators understand this word to mean that he underwent circumcision, that was the the aspect of joy as part of his conversion and new association with the Jewish nation. Others emphasise his association with non-Jews, understanding the word vayachad, meaning that his body shriveled up in anguish over the loss of the Egyptians. Well, it actually doesn't sort of say that in Exodus. Um, but others say that joy just means joy. He was happy. 
But it's always good to have a little dig around and see what those scriptures might shed some light on. It sounds like Jethro heard what Adonai had done and followed him since he presented a burnt offering and sacrifices to God. Aaron came along with all his elders, or with all the elders, and they had a meal together. Jethro was a man who asked really good questions. And Moses didn't get defensive either, did he? When um, Jethro said, actually, I don't think you should be doing that. And Moses didn't, who do you think you are? You only got saved five minutes ago. He didn't say that, but you'd think he might. But if Jethro is an older man, and maybe he was in politics or he, he was used to leading people, Jethro gave Moses the plan. I just wonder if it had been Moses' mother-in-law telling him the plan if he'd accepted the advice so easily. Verse 23, Jethro says, if you do this thing, like delegate the jobs that he just talked to Moses about, as God so commands you, then you'll be able to endure and all these people with you. So this advice kind of turned into a word from the Lord. And still Moses listened, and in verse 24, he did everything he said. There's some interesting and profound explanations as to why it was Jethro that got to tell Moses what to do. Again, looking at some commentators, it says, God purposefully concealed this idea from Moses so that Jethro would be honoured by the people when God approved his suggestion. Or... The suggestion was given before the giving of the Torah. So aside from Moses, no one knew the law, so no one could judge. Jethro wasn't aware that he was witnessing a temporary arrangement that would come to an end soon after the giving of the Torah. So uh, Jethro hadn't been there at the beginning, and he wasn't going to be afterwards. It's just this little pocket of history that he gets to go and give his advice, and then he buzzed off again. A matter of diplomacy and etiquette. It wouldn't have been respectful for the Jews to tell Moses that they needed a judge, that they needed someone else apart from him. Moses didn't want to tell the children of Israel to appoint someone else, so they didn't think he was weak. And God didn't command it because then it would have shown that Adonai thought Moses was weak. So Jethro was the man for the moment. He was kind of neutral. And then there's a difference of spiritual perspectives. Moses perceived and understood the Torah on, an, on a higher level. Remember, he had the relationship with God as the people didn't. And they were suggesting that Jethro looked on, he'd used to dealing with people, and figured out that they needed someone to kind of break down the law for them and to be able to judge them and help them. I'd love to know how they decided which uh, problems were too big to, for them to deal with themselves and which were the big ones that went to Moses. Interesting, isn't it? Hmm. Then Jethro departed in Exodus 18. So who, who was he really? Well, he was mentioned three times in the Torah and the prophets and in lots of, of the rabbinical literature, Jethro gets a mention and I guess he's got a parashah named after him. Numbers 10 is the last mention in the Torah when Moses asked Jethro to stay with him, but Jethro wanted to go home. And then he's again mentioned in Judges and First Chronicles. Now, if you go through to try and have a look about Jethro, you will see that Jethro is given seven different names in the scriptures. No wonder he was hard to find. Before meeting Moses, Jethro had experimented with quite a lot of religions and beliefs of the time, and according to some, was an advisor together with Balaam and Job to the Pharaoh. That's an interesting thought, especially Balaam. Balaam suggested the enslavement of the Jews, and Jethro opposed it and, um, and left Egypt. At some point, he rose to the level of being the main priest of the religion of the Midian, and eventually he rejected that religion too. So it sounds like he's going, he's, he's, he's not sure where he stands, what to believe in, and so then he goes into the desert to meet with Moses. And then, I guess, if, you, if you're in, it's how good it is that Moses had a great testimony of what God had done, because Jethro was ripe, wasn't he, to hear about Adonai and the God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Joseph, uh, Jacob. He wasn't that right then, though, was he? Yes, he was. And all the events, um, 
all the events, he heard about the events uh, surrounding the exodus from Egypt and he became convinced that the God of the Jews was the true God and he be- went to the desert to convert. And as I said, he's got seven names. Uh, Yita, Yitro Jethro, Chofav, Rehual, Petial, Kine. And I thought about Certainly, it makes it hard for us to figure out who Jethro is when he's got seven names. But I guess Yeshua had lots of names, like we read in Isaiah. He had a name, Wonderful Counselor. He had the name, Son of God and the Son of Man. And we are called, we have lots of names. We have, we're called free. We're called loved. We're called superhero. We're called accepted and forgiven. We were talking about names today as we were setting up because... Some of us had nicknames when we were little. And my dad used to call me Wee Willy. <laughs> um, because of the nursery rhyme, Wee Willy R- Winky runs through the town. And because when he came home from milking the cows, I was in my nightie running around in the house, and he called me Wee Willy. And some of the people in set up, they had some very strange um, nicknames. My maiden name was Beach, so I got called Beach Ball, Beach Buggy, and kids tried to jump on my back so they could have a swim. (laughs) We all have different names, but let's be sure that we are named the name that God gave us. He called us great names. So if that voice in your head calls you something terrible, it is not the Holy Spirit. So the deliverance of the Jewish people from Egypt has a modern-day parallel because we've mentioned the, heel, uh, the remembrance of the Holocaust. When Jews emigrated from Europe to the safety of Israel by planes and others from very perilous situations were airlifted to safely make Aliyah to Israel. So how nice it is we're doing these readings today. God rescued his people then. He rescued them. Um, some would say that he didn't really rescue them over the Holocaust, and, but he will, he's always had a heart for his people. It's just the evilness of, peop, of other people that can, um, wreck, to, can wreck it. So now God has set Israel and its leadership on a course. God meets with his people and lays down his code, the Ten Commandments. And he calls them a, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, for the whole world to see. Just as in the New Covenant, that's what we're called. We're called um, holy, aren't we? He has made us to be a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever in Revelations. While flames of fire enveloped the smoking mountain of Sinai, his majestic voice pronounced the Ten Words, the Ten Commandments to this day are considered relevant and a guide for con- conduct for all humanity. The, fi- the first five deal with our relationship with God and the second five deal with our relationship with, with each other. These things are good when they're working, aren't they? Yep. He didn't just give the laws to tidy up human society. Each commandment communicates a piece of divine revelation, a piece of godliness. Godliness. They're more than just rules for governing human behavior. The laws of the Torah reflect the lawgiver and how important people are to him. Yeshua told us in Luke 6.45 that out of the overflow of the heart, The mouth speaks. And when God broke the silence and spoke to his creation at Mount Sinai, he spoke from the fullness of his heart. Each law and commandment, no matter how small or seemingly irrelevant, communicates a piece of revelation from God, an overflowing of his heart. The Ten Commandments are moral absolutes. They were spoken aloud by God and everyone heard them. They require no further justification and they're non-negotiable. They're well known. Non-believers and believers alike know about the Ten Commandments. Yeshua summed up these ten mitzvot, indeed the entire Torah, with these words. Love the Adonai your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and all your mind. And 
love your neighbour as yourself. These are the Ten Commandments all wrapped up. At Mount Sinai, the Jewish people entered into a covenant with God willingly and enthusiastically. The conditions of the covenant were laid out and the responsibilities of each party were clearly specified by God. So this contract between God and the Jewish people is a bit like a wedding. The conditions of the covenant between the bride and the groom are written in the ketubah, the Jewish marriage contract. The cloud at Sinai was like the chuppah, the marriage canopy, under which the Jewish bride enters into the covenantal relationship of marriage with her bridegroom. And at Mount Sinai, God clearly stated his expectations of his bride and what he is prepared to offer. Israel, his bride, said, I do, in Exodus 19 verse 8. In fact, in Jeremiah 3 verse 14, God is referred to as Israel's husband and Ezekiel 16 as God's wife. Every bride is given a token as a sign to her, his, her betrothal. What was the token of betrothal God gave to Israel that day? It is the Shabbat. God said, this day of rest will be a sign between him and the people of Israel. And I'm new to keeping the Shabbat like we do now, and I love it. I just feel so much better. God also gave his bride a wedding gift, the land of Israel. This is the covenant I'll make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I'll put my Torah in their minds and write it on their hearts. And it says that in Jeremiah. And then we, this brings about the blood covenant of Yeshua where he shed for all mankind. And all who accept and become his disciples to become part of his bride, awaiting his return and the marriage supper of the Lamb. I'm so glad there's going to be food. Preceding Yeshua's endorsement that he came to fulfill and complete the Torah, not abolish it, like we read it this morning. He ascended the mountain, gave his disciples a further ten words, the Beatitudes. And those are to be written on our heart too, aren't they? They're a new way of living. It is believed that when God gave Israel the Torah, he told Moses to approach the woman first. Jewish sages also believe that women would first receive the teachings of the Messiah. While Yeshua taught many women, we know from Scripture that another Miriam became the first eyewitness to Yeshua's resurrection from the dead, the absolute sign of Yeshua's Messiahship and victory over sin. In a culture where women witnesses were not thought to possess credibility, this was an extraordinary event brought about by the Holy Spirit, and he wanted us all to know that. According to Jewish tradition, the ten words or commandments were given on Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, Pentecost, the same festival in which the Ruach Hagodesh descended upon the disciples with a supernatural manifestation of speaking in other tongues. And if we really want to be truly living epistles, then we need to ask the Holy Spirit for that gift in us. In 2 Corinthians 3 verse 3, it says, It is clear that you are a letter from Messiah, delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the Ruach of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Let us walk accordingly, and so shine the light of Yeshua. And I wanted to read, I, I wondered if you'd get your Bibles out again, please. And I'd really like to, us to read Hebrews 12, the reading that Brendan did again. Because it's, I think we need to read it to ourselves. We need to read it together. And if you've got a different version, don't worry. You can just read it anyway. Because as I read this, I thought this is such a wonderful message for us. And it just reminds us of who we are, the God we serve, and what his plan is. Hebrews 12, verse 18. For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched, and to a blazing fire, and to darkness, and gloom, and storm, and to the blast of a shofar, and a voice whose words made those who heard it beg that not another word be spoken to them. For they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. So terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am quaking with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, 
to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, a joyous gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are written in a scroll of heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous ones made perfect, and to Yeshua the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks of something better than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse the one who is speaking, for if they did not escape when they refused the one who was warning them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject the one who warns us from heaven. His voice shook the earth then, but he has promised, saying, Yet once more I will, not, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. Now this phrase, yet once more, shows the removal of those things that are shaken, that is created things, to that which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude through this may we offer worship in a pleasing, in a manner pleasing to God with reverence and awe. And I think it, those scriptures just sum up what we've been talking about today. How wonderful. How wonderful. We don't have to go onto a mountain or follow um, fire and cloud. We have the Ruach HaGodesh in our lives if we have asked Yeshua to be Lord of our lives. How wonderful that we don't have to be afraid. We have to have, be, um, have the awe of God in our lives, but we don't have to be afraid of him because he loves us and every page tells us that he loves us. And the patterns and the whole seasons that we've gone through. And I, I pray that today that your name is a good name that the name that you know about yourself in relationship with God is a good one. And so we're going to sing um, together. Jenny and has chosen a song. And um, let's sing now and just reflect on what God has spoken to us about this morning and express it as we sing together. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat shalom.